All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering all sorts of hot nonsense from YouTube. Lots of gems, lots of Bruce Lee KFG conspiracy theories, and lots of, I heard, your Wing Chun only has eight weapons. Let's get to it. And every day, I practice martial arts. <laughs> Yo, Dre, how you doing, man? Uh, I'm doing rather well, Sifu. Thank you for asking. Yeah, of course. Here we are, another Saturday morning podcast. We need to fix that. Fix what? What are you talking about? My hair is flawless. <laughs> are you going to say the hair lady didn't do a good job fixing my hair before we went on the yeah. air? She did a hair lady being my Dean. Botched you. Uh huh. Dre has no business. Oh, my hair's going up here. Okay, yeah. Look at you. It's a, you know what's weird? I notice it's like this weird kind of passive aggressive thing with dudes who don't have hair always talking <laughs> shit about hair. All right. One hundred percent. My uh, my late uh, podcast partner. I mean, I have hair. Yeah, my late podcast partner, Big Sean Madigan. Yeah. Literally gave me shit about my hair all the time. All the time. And he had a shaved head because he was balding. And he gave me shit for my hair. And it's always people like yeah. who have either they shave their head or they have no right. hair. And they're like, man, your hair's a little out of place. There's it's only like, two, two types of dudes that shave their head. Yeah. Bald dudes who mm -hmm. don't have hair and balding. When you're balding. Yes. You yes. Shave. Well, that's not true at all. I shaved my head for 20 years and I've got a full head of hair. Right. Yeah, yeah, so what right. are you talking about? Yeah, he I'm couldn't shaving. afford you to go to the barber. It, that's why. You didn't shave a dip. <laughs> 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 All right. So anyway, what you got for me today? All right. Let's go right into it. Shadow Mancer 101. Shadow Mancer. Return questioner. Q. Q. All right. All right. Hi, KFG, Dre, and Andrew. <laughs> Love oh, my the show. God. Love Everyone the show. shits on the BFG. <laughs> Duh F. Really? Wait, wait. Duh F. Oh, that's right. He's not in there. No, he's not in there. Oh, I didn't even Dude. notice. And, and you know the crazy thing about the BFG, like he gets no love. He's literally in here. You hear him from time to time. Yeah. Literally no one sees Andrew. He's the editor. And he gets more love. He gets more love than the BFG. <laughs> what? Oh, this is what? great. This is great. <laughs> I think uh, it's because, you know, I, you know what's crazy? Remember I was saying he reminds me of Captain Crunch? It's not Captain Crunch. Who is it? It's Captain Kangaroo. Oh, Captain Kangaroo. Although... He kind of does look like Captain Crunch. If you put that hat on him, right? He kind of looks like Captain that Crunch. Hat. Captain Crunch kind of short and kind of stocky. That hat that right? Comes but yeah, his. yeah. Exactly that hat. Mikey Dean's kind of short and stocky. Uh -huh. If he was Captain Crunch Ooh. for Halloween and and his friends saw him they'd be like, "Oh dude, that was that's the perfect costume for you." Oh. Right? But Captain like, Kangaroo uh, would be good too. That'd be a good costume for him. I guess. With the right. bangs? No, nah, man. The bangs, I'm, I'm, just go, I'm gonna go as Lilo and stitch with someone, but I'm gonna go as Lilo. Hey yo, that's an A yo. Yeah, I don't even get that reference. I, I, all right, so, I, I, <laughs> all right, I do not look like Captain Crunch, by the way. I'm looking at photos. He, you bastards! Not he Captain. Looks, no, Captain Kangaroo. No, he looks like Captain Crunch. You look, exactly. look a little he bit like Captain Crunch. Crunch. Hey, you look a little bit like Captain Andrew, Crunch. Put it right here. All right. And, and put, put it right so, here. So you're uh, put it right here. Besides, Andrew. besides Captain Crunch, right do you have a celebrity right doppelganger? Does anyone tell you that you remind them of someone? Captain. Well, yeah. I mean, I've had a couple. Bob Hoskins was one of them. Bob Hoskins. Oh my God, that's right. Bob Hoskins, the late Bob Hoskins. The late Bob Hoskins. Who, by the way, was in a movie with Jet Li. You talking about he Roger was, Rabbit? Yes, yeah, that's that Danny right. the Dog movie, right? Yes, yeah. that's correct. Roger that's Rabbit, right. Bob Hoskins. Yes, that yes, Bob Hoskins. That Bob Hoskins. Wow. All right. Yeah. Who's your celebrity doppelganger? It's like Vin Diesel. I hate, but I hate this question. Tell me. Tell me. It's, it's, it's Yip Man. It's Vin Diesel, right? <laughs> Yip Man. Well, we, we mentioned it before. If, if, if you take Dre and you shine a light on him and you look at his shadow that he casts on the wall... It oh, looks yeah. exactly yes. like Yip Man, like the head shape, everything, right? right? You have the perfect silhouette of Yip Man, From right? behind, I can play yes. Yip Man. But who's your celebrity doppelganger? Is it Vin Diesel? They said it's Vin Diesel. But you're a, you're, you're a thin Diesel. They say, yeah. Or Slim Diesel. Min, yeah, Min Slim Diesel, Diesel, Slim right. Diesel. Yeah. Slim Weasel. Yeah. I have... I have oh. One celebrity doppelganger, the which dude is... From, the dude... The dude from Married with Children. All right? <laughs> <laughs> right. When I was when when I was younger, I wasn't even you, you, say you know, him. You know Bud I wasn't Bundy, even say him. David Faustino, played by David Faustino. Yeah. I follow him on Instagram, that is, right? That's a good one. Every when I was younger, 
uh, especially the unshaven version of me, looks like David Faustino. Yes, and and people used to tell me all the time, they're like, dude, you look like Bud Bundy from Married with Children, which is weird because he like wasn't the coolest character in the world. And then years ago, yeah. because like you have to imagine, like through most of my teens, people would be like, you kind of look like Bud Bundy, right? And it was like, uh, and I like everyone liked that I've show. I've seen back that then, dude right? somewhere. I can't remember I, where. I was on the New York subway. I was like on the end line. I might have seen him on the subway. And David Faustino was on the train. Yo. And like I, I saw him, and it's weird because like your whole life, okay, you watch it like I saw him on Married with Children, mm-hmm. and then there he is like chilling with his girlfriend or his wife or whatever. And I looked at him. He's a little shorter than me. Yeah. And like I just stared at him like a dope because I'm like, oh my God, like this is the guy that everyone says that I look like. And I'm wondering, yeah, had anyone gone up to him and be like, yo, dude, you look like the KFG. <laughs> And then, and, the, and, and then and then we <laughs> see each other, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, then some lo- slow melodic That's song good. plays in the background <laughs> as we lock eyes, right? Oh, um, although, and I don't. Well, I told you about like the Chinese Chinese people think I look like uh, Iron Man, right? <laughs> yeah, that uh, was the a beard, good like that the Tony Stark one, one, right? Because you have a beard. Because I have a beard, right? Because because <sighs> Chinese people think all white people look the same, right? <laughs> Who's so, the guy that wrote Hamilton? What's what's this guy named? Well, oh, Lin Manuel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Manuel Noriega. Lin Manuel Miranda. <laughs> Lin-Manuel Miranda. <laughs> right, right. No, I actually had uh, one of my mom's family friends told me I look like him, yeah. and and pe- yeah, people say I look like him. Uh, but one time, I shit thee not, and I don't see the connection at all. I was walking don't in my I was walking in my neighborhood, RZA, and uh, no, there, yeah, someone <laughs> thought I was Method Man, and uh, and someone thought I was um, oh man, uh, who's that? Uh, Jake Gyllenhaal. All what? right, yes, yo, so, you. So I had I had, have a little Jake. I, Gyllenhaal I had I had a hoodie on. on. And I looked almost like I was trying to, like, kind of disguise myself a little yeah. bit. And there was one of, you know, those, like, Russian guys who hold the... Uh, he was, like, in his 20s. He holds, like, a sign for some shop. He's, like, paid to, like, give out uh, flyers. Uh, and he looks at me and he goes, Jake Gyllenhaal. <laughs> Jake Gyllenhaal. <laughs> and I look at him and I'm like, man, I keep walking. Goes, you are Jake Gyllenhaal. You are Jake Gyllenhaal. Mm-hmm. He goes, it's oh, my God. Good. And he's looking at me and he goes, it's Jake Gyllenhaal, I right? Love- and I thought it when was like just him trying to like, you know, because yeah. he's trying to pass out flyers and make a name with uh-huh. him. No, dude seriously thought it was Jake Gyllenhaal. He followed me from Steinway to like 34th Street. Like he just kept following me. He's like, tell me you're Jake Gyllenhaal. Tell me you're Jake Gyllenhaal. And I'm like, dude, leave me alone. And it's like, you know, in his mind, that's exactly what Jake Gyllenhaal would say, right? <laughs> it's like, no, dude, seriously, go away. This is weird, all right? This is weird. Uh, I assure you, all right? Uh, Jake Gyllenhaal is not trying to catch the end train at damn, 30th Avenue. That's good <laughs> like, stuff. That's good stuff. Yeah, so anyway, uh, oh, let's continue with our, uh, our question here. Doppelgang gang. All right, love the show. And the recent episode on Wing Chun Historians. I was wondering if you know of any alternative weapons to BJD and long pole and other Wing Chun systems, traditional swords, short staffs, spears, etc. Big love from HK and hope you guys can visit us out here soon. Yeah, that's right. So Hong Kong has uh, lifted a number of restrictions. Well, they're not totally open, but they've lifted a number of restrictions. But I think in the next... <sighs> In the next few months, uh, I think it'll be a lot easier to travel to Hong Kong. So, which is good because in this entire uh, time of uh, the virus of unknown origins, um, we uh, <laughs> have not been able to go to Hong Kong. Okay. And usually, I do a yearly trip with my students to Hong this Kong. Is, this is true. So uh, that means that in um, 2023, we'll mm-hmm. probably have our next. You're gonna have to make up for the last five mm-hmm. years. That's right. Five years. That was five years. <laughs> five years ago, we went. <laughs> that was for, yeah, with you guys, right? Yeah. So um, usually what I do is I take a number of my students to Hong Kong and I basically give them the tour. All right. Mm. Because like most people, you've been to Hong Kong, you know, there's no better tour guide than me because I can point out I can point out weird stuff. Even the locals don't know. (laughs) And, you know, like we'll be in a random part of Hong Kong and I'll be like, Uh yo, we need to walk down this alley to go cut through there. Like I know like how to get around there. Right. Yes. Um, So I'm thinking that, you know, in the time since we were in Hong Kong last, I built up this podcast. So I'm thinking that maybe next year, uh, because basically what I do is I do essentially a tour of Hong Kong, do some like uh, go to sites that are Bruce like Lee relevant. Yeah, Bruce Lee sites, uh, Yip Man stuff, Wing Chun stuff. And then, you know, we, we do some training. So what I might do is open it up for uh, KFG 
fans and listeners, if they oh, want to come, lit. maybe we have some kind of package to go to Hong Kong or something like that. If that's something that you guys are interested in, because I'm going to go anyway with my students, whether whether y'all KFG listeners want to go or not. Anyway, I'm still going anyway. That's but if that's something wow. that that everyone wants to do, we can maybe like arrange something, mm -hmm. and because uh, we have plenty of time to plan now. Uh, that's still at least a year's away. So uh, let me know in the comments if that's something you want to do. So yeah, excited to finally go back to Hong Kong. Last time I was there was August 2019. And well, we shot all that footage with yeah. Sifu Chan Chi Man. Luckily, before he passed away, we have, we got all that stuff. So, um, so anyway, uh, that's a good question. Now, of course, the topic of weapons in martial arts. I think what, what especially like in Wing Chun, I think people think that... Um, when when a lot of like foreigners think of Wing Chun, they think of like okay, the style was developed like in a vacuum, like of the either the Yim Wing Chun and Moi or whoever. Like the style was developed, which included the fist fighting stuff and the weapons, and it was this perfect package with the fist fighting, the theories, the weapons, and everything all put together. Mm -hmm. And then this package <laughs> is then hand delivered to the next generation, which is then hand delivered to the next generation. Right. So if a style does not have a weapon. Um, it's because it didn't have it there originally, right? Mm. And if you start now adding stuff, then you are changing the style from the way it was or you're diluting it or you're creating like some kind of chop suey kung fu style. And that's not the way it is at all, all right? Mm. So um, every generation, whether they want to admit it or not, the, the weird thing is we all know that every generation of martial arts, whether Chinese, Japanese, whatever, every generation add some stuff, they take some things away, they improve certain things, they refine certain things. It's just, for some reason, the Chinese don't want to admit that. They want to pretend that the martial art mm. they're practicing is it's this pure. untouched museum piece uh -huh. from previous generations. And uh -huh. they are the only one that have this untouched version of this museum piece, right? Even if that were possible, all right? Because you know we know that even within the same school, uh, different uh, senior students will do things differently, all right? Then you have to pretend somehow that was not the case for the previous 200 years of your style. Mm. It's just the case for your style all right now. All of a sudden. Right? right, okay? Of course, it was always that way, right? So even if somehow there were lineages that could claim to teach a perfect museum piece of the their founder's vision of the art, all right. I, I would say that's not even necessarily a good thing. That might be good in terms of historical value. You go like, look, we can see what this style originally looked like. But in terms of relevance, I mean, like when you look at boxers mm -hmm. from the 40s and 50s. All right. Oh, and then you compare yeah. it to boxers today in terms of like the way better and more intelligent use of footwork and, and evasion and, and better conditioning protocols and strength training protocols, you know. Um, you know, back in those days, a boxer would like chop wood for strength and conditioning. You know what I mean? Um, that art, which is still essentially the same art, it's it's you have your basic punches, but it has evolved because you have so many people come into the game and bringing something and refining and trying new things. Um, if someone were to come, if the best boxer were to come back from the 1940s or 1950s, I guarantee you they would have problems in their weight class against whoever the best was in their weight class today just because the current generation is standing on the shoulders of those giants, right? Wow. But the same thing goes for every other martial art. It's just that Chinese martial arts or Chinese martial artists believe they and their styles are immune to this evolutionary fact, which is relevance for every other style, yeah. but they believe, no, 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 400 years ago, 300 years ago, 200 years ago, our style had this whole thing figured out, mm. okay? So in the Qing dynasty, when the Wing Chun masters had never seen a boxer, had never seen a kickboxer, had never seen a grappler, and worse yet, had never seen someone who can punch, kick, and grapple the way they can now, they still managed to figure everything out back then. Instead of... What most likely is the truth, those styles were developed very specifically to fight against local martial arts, all right? Because first of all, that's all you see. You don't have, the internet was totally shit in the Qing dynasty. Yeah. So it was very difficult to wait. When you wanted to watch videos of Northern styles in the Qing dynasty, was a dial up, man. You, you had to wait yeah. for hours for that shit to buffer, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. And then your sounds. homeboy would yeah. pick up the other line and then would ruin your whole connection. <laughs> you know how it was, right? Oh, man. So, you know, these styles were, were very reactionary to what what they had to fight around the corner 
Um, and they didn't know anything about Western styles or other martial arts or even Japanese styles for that matter, right? Yeah. So, they didn't um, know there were other countries over there. <laughs> exactly, all right? They thought China was the center of the universe, <laughs> right. right? So um, you have these like ideas in Chinese martial arts that every style that we do is this like fixed package that has been handed like a like a baton in a relay race in perfect form from one generation to the next generation mm -hmm. and this is not the case at all all right uh, every generation adds something takes something away puts something in p changes things around rearranges stuff whatever and the same thing goes for weapons and that transmission now um wing chun people sometimes find it kind of strange that uh you know other kung fu styles have all these weapons you know these uh, 18 weapons or all these, you know, all these variations of swords and hook swords and uh, Kwando and all this stuff. And we just have two weapons. Yeah. Right. And and arguably a lot of Wing Chun people don't even many of them haven't learned the weapons. They don't learn the weapons and they don't train it. Truthfully, most Wing Chun people are not that good, even with the two weapons that they learn, because modern Wing Chun people are more attracted to the fist fighting side of things. Right. Yeah. The, you know how to, you know, close the gap. That's what I'm fight attracted against. to. Yeah. I mean, for the and, and I mean, it makes sense. So. If someone is attracted to a martial art like Hongkun, then they want to learn different forms and different weapons, and they're more than likely going to put in the time to get good at that stuff. Wing Chun people are like, oh, yeah, it's, it's cool if I learn the poem. I mean, when, you, when I see most videos of many Sifus practicing with the weapons, it, it looks like they, they're doing it, but they're going through the motions. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, I learned it. It's like something in our style we have to do. It's almost like busy work that they're required to do, right? <laughs> um, and, and you don't really see that same kind of like, for example, when I uh, spend time with Mak Sifu, and we actually discuss Chinese martial art weapons and why they're developed the way they are and how they are built, uh, uh, to f uh, how the forms are constructed to fight against different types of styles and weapons and stuff like that. Um, those are conversations most Wing Chun people aren't having because they're just not seasoned enough with the weapons. Now, um, and so I think that that's like a cultural, not Chinese cultural thing, it's a Wing Chun cultural thing, that the weapons mm -hmm. are kind of these cherries on top that you learn at the end of the more important cake of fist fighting you know what i mean like you learn the cake and then yeah at the end you put the whipped cream is the pole and the cherry is the knives all right yeah you got that there but everyone really just cares about the cake right all right um whereas other more traditional styles of chinese martial arts are way more into the weapon i mean the average hongkun practitioner who's good at the weapons will slice the shit out of most wing chun grandmasters <laughs> with their so-called ba cham do and stuff like that oh good and not because those techniques are better just they're way more practiced i mean all these guys in Europe, uh, you know, my Sihangs who have left the WT organization call themselves grandmasters and show all this awesome knife stuff or whatever. Yeah, show me how you stop Maxifu's broadsword attack with your bacham do. He will slice your head off, all right? Okay? So, uh, <laughs> I, um, I mean, stop, all right? When you say stuff like that, my brain photographs it or, yes, or yes. videography Maxivo with his yeah, perfect hair yeah. oh. slicing the head off some yeah. German guy with gold stripes yeah, on his I, pants right? in his head rolls and yes exactly. in his school with the blue curtain and Maxivo's perfect hair yeah. has not even moved not even budged right? yeah so um, so again to come back to the weapons uh, what most people don't understand when they're comparing Wing Chun to the other uh, styles of Chinese martial arts that have way more weapons is that traditionally most southern styles only had two weapons um, you had one long weapon and one short weapon. And the long weapon was usually the long pole mm -hmm. or maybe a type of staff or maybe a spear. But more than likely, it was actually a long pole. Um, and usually a tan tao guan. Tan tao guan is a single-headed pole. Single-headed pole means you use the one end of the pole tan to hit. Guan. Yeah, tan means single, like tan chi, single arm chi zhao. Uh. Tao is head, guan is pole. Single-headed pole. And that means that you only use the end to hit your opponent, as opposed to a, a shorter staff where you we hold it more in the it. middle and you use both sides. That's called Seng Tao Guan, okay. which is a double-headed pole because you hit with both ends. When you hold a Wing Chun long pole, you don't hit it with the end that you're holding. It makes no sense. If you have a <laughs> if you have a nine-foot long pole, why are you going to shorten it just to hit with the other end? It literally makes no yeah, sense. You have right. a long weapon, you use it for its range, right? So that's why we call it a single-headed pole. Most Southern styles had some kind of single-headed long weapon, all right, whether it's a, like a lance or a spear or a long pole or just like a really long staff. And then they usually had one short weapon, which is usually a sword or usually in the case of Southern styles, it's the double knives. So actually Wing Chun for having two weapons, one long, one short, and specifically a long pole and short knives 
actually makes Wing Chun an extremely orthodox Southern style of Chinese martial okay. arts. Okay. Okay. It's just that we look at some of these other styles that have multiple weapons and we go, that's the norm. Not necessarily. If you look at the older versions of Hong Kun, like even back in the day of Wong Fei Hong, all right? Um, it did not have nearly as many weapons as the current iteration of Hong Kun. Hmm. It had the pole, it had the uh, short knives, and maybe a couple other weapons. But it didn't have this whole variety of weapons that they have now. And the reason is, when uh, specifically in Hong Kun, when it came to Hong Kong through Lam Sai Wing, and Lam Sai Wing taught his, uh, his adopted uh, nephew, Lam Zhou, Lam Zhou, um, added a bunch of forms from other styles, particularly northern styles. Now, Hong Kun is a southern style, but uh, Lam Zhou was friends with Gan Dak Hoi. Gan Dak Hoi was the grandmaster of Dai Seng Pekwar, which is a northern style, and they okay. have all sorts of weapons. And Lam Zhou really liked Gan Dak Hoi's, like, for example, his uh, broadsword. And so he ended up adopting a lot of these northern weapons into mm. Hong Kun. Now, the current iteration of Lam Zhou's system, which is Hong Kun, a southern martial art, has actually a fair amount of northern weapons. Mm -hmm. And that was added in the last century. Was this like a know your enemy type of thing? Like No, I, I just think, um, uh, I, I don't know the reason. All uh -huh. right, you, you would have to t talk, to, I'm talking, that's out of my wheelhouse to answer that question. You have to ask Maxi for, ask someone from that lineage. Um, why he added that stuff. But I do know that Lam Zhou, when he was younger, he had some opera training. So he did things like a little bit lower and he, he, he there was a slightly more operatic feel. That's not to say what he was doing was less effective. I'm just saying the idea of kind of adding more things in choreography. Also, Lam Zhou created more Doi Chak. Doi Chak is the two-man sets. So it was almost like you would learn, for example, a broadsword, mm. and then you would learn a two-man set. So you would learn how to face off with someone else with the weapon or with another weapon. So it was almost like a, a two-person form. Right. And Lam Zhou created a bunch of those. Yeah. So it was almost like you learn the form and then you learn this two-man set to give you an idea of how to apply the form. But those were things that were added in the last century, right? If you didn't know the it's history... Like our sections. Yes, exactly. Okay. If you didn't know the history, you would think, oh, these are like super ancient things, but these are things that were created maybe in the 1940s or something like that, right? They're not even 100 years old. So... Even the martial arts that have all of these weapons, these are a lot of these additions are recent things. Mm -hmm. So traditionally, I think most styles, most of the orthodox styles that you know of only had a couple weapons because one Sifu, one master cannot really learn how to fight with 10 different weapons reliably. You normally learn maybe one or two weapons and that was in the style that you did. It's just that later, as martial arts started to go into the modern era, especially in Hong Kong, and because of the Jing Wu Academy, that now you have different martial artists of different styles coming together and looking at what the other person is doing and going, oh, I like that form, maybe I'm gonna add this to my style, add a Kwando, add this uh, a weapon set or whatever. So the idea of mixing weapons or adding weapons is more of a modern thing. So okay. to kind of circle back to this question, some people go like, well, how come Wing Chun only has two weapons? Because we're actually an extremely orthodox traditional style mm. that has not gone the route of adding more things in there, right? Because Wing Chun, through most of its history, was, was not really taught openly. Hmm. And um, so it didn't really have that kind of like, oh, I like all these Hungar forms. Let me add them into my Wing Chun because it has nothing to do with how Wing Chun fights. So um, having said that, there are some styles in Fatsan and, some, and in China, some Wing Chun styles that claim to have additional weapons, like even things like rope darts and things like that. But that does not mean that somehow Yim Wing Chun and Moi had a secret rope dart form <laughs> that got missing and this one lineage still has what? it. Okay, When you see these additional weapons, these are most likely added by a Sifu of a certain generation that may have also learned that from another source and mm -hmm. then put it in there and then added that as opposed to what our knee-jerk reaction is. If you see a Wing Chun style that has four weapons instead of two, you go... Uh, oh, is our version of Wing Chun, did we lose two weapons? As opposed to, did that guy just add two weapons to their Wing Chun, mm. right? And okay. also, do those two weapons actually adhere to Wing Chun concept? That's the other thing, too. Because um, it's easy, there's so many weapons forms out there. Broadsword and Kwon Do and all, Chain Whip and all this really cool stuff. Mm -hmm. But the question is, in Wing Chun, we want to fight according to a certain concept and principle. 
And when you look at the Wing Chun Long Po, Lok Tim Pun Guan, Lok Tim Pun Guan is not even an original Wing Chun Long Po form. Lok Tim Pun Guan exists outside of Wing Chun, and it was brought, so even that Long Po form was brought into Wing Chun from an outside source. Mm. But when it came into Wing Chun, Wing Chun people modified it to follow the Wing Chun concept. So when you look at the Wing Chun Lok Tim Pun Guan, it's not exactly the same as the Lok Tim Pun Guan, which exists outside of Wing Chun. And the reason it's not the same is because Wing Chun people sullied it with Wing Chun ideas, all right? <laughs> they, they, uh, they, they added Qi Guan, and okay, then they added all so these good. kind of Wing Chun concepts and Wing Chun names to the movements, Tan Guan, Fu Guan, Bong Guan, and they kind of Wing Chunified it. So that's another reason why when Wing Chun people uh, especially those from more conservative lineages talk about, oh, we do the authentic, pure Wing Chun long pole. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that is an oxymoron. All right? Because Lok Tim Bun Guan is a Wing Chun pole fighting system that predates, so that existed before it came into Wing Chun. And then when it came into Wing Chun, it was modified by Wing Chun masters to follow the Wing Chun ideas, which are automatically means it's not the original one. It just, mm. It's a new thing. It's a Wing Chun version of Lok Tim Bun Guan. It is not the original version of Lok Tim Bun Guan. So people are like, oh, we teach the most authentic Wing Chun Lok Tim Bun Guan. I'm like, which, which, what are you talking about? All right. It doesn't even make any sense. Okay. Um, because it's already modified. Right. Um, but still, Wing Chun people took an outside form and made it their own to integrate it with the core concepts that you would have already learned in fist fighting instead of just... Well, oh, this broadsword form is really cool. Let's just bolt it onto our style and make the students learn this broadsword form after wooden dummy. Even though that broadsword form, as cool as it is, has nothing to do with the Wing Chun that you're learning. You see what I mean? Okay. For me, that's like bolting something on that makes no sense. Um, the long pole fits the Wing Chun idea. Then you look at the Ba Cham Do, and the Ba Cham Do is essentially Wing Chun with bladed, two bladed weapons. All right. Mm -hmm. There are some movements that are obviously specific to fighting against other weapons that are different from the fist fighting. But for the most part, it's very similar to the Buji form, but with with bladed hands, more or less. So our knives follow the Wing Chun concept. So they are all right, whether they're original or whatever, Wing Chun weapons forms. They're not just random weapons that were added into the Wing Chun system. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing or whatever. If you wanted to also learn other weapons to increase your knowledge, that's fine. But mm -hmm. if we're talking about what's cohesive in terms of the Wing Chun system as such, those two weapons are. And then just adding, for example, a chain whip in there would be like, are you going to do pax out and use your chain whip or are you just going to do chain whip stuff okay all right you, you, you know what i mean so so wow. um does it actually make sense into the uh grand scheme of your style or are you just bolting something onto it like like putting tire trucks or tire wheels on a sports car right so um yeah, uh, hmm. there are always going to be Wing Chun styles that claim that they have weapons that the Yip Man version doesn't have. Mm. And they're going to claim that that makes them more authentic. But uh, my counter question to that is, how do you know that someone just didn't add that shit at some point? So right? if, if like and, my generation, mm -hmm. I can add like a Rambo knife and a Glock. And as long as 100 use, years from now, no one will, they won't even know. They will assume that came from the Qing Dynasty. <laughs> All That's right? lit. As people get dumber and dumber as we go I'm on, a, right? Especially the Glock. Yes. The Glock? Yeah, yeah, definitely from the Qing Dynasty. Yes. Yeah. All right, cool. I try that. What else you got for me? Hey, Kung Fu Genius listeners. Are you a fan of Wing Chun Kung Fu? Well, if you listen to me, I assume you are. I got great news for KFG fans. Right now, you can get an all-access, one-month free trial subscription to Wing Chun Illustrated Magazine. Yes, I said free. Go to WCINewsstand.com and register in the upper right-hand corner. Fill out your email and password and use the code KFG Trial to get your free trial to all the issues from 2011 to the current issue. That's right all the issues, even the one with this cool guy on the cover. That's me for those of you listening to us on audio. My Kung Fu Genius column is also in all the new issues as if you needed another reason to get this awesome magazine. Go get your free trial subscription today. For all that information, check out the description below. And now back to me. All right. So next up, we got Michael Cooney. Awesome. Not related to the famous George. Alex. You say Cooney or Clooney? I say 
Yeah, what'd you say? I yeah. said, Alex, don't you think at some point... He thinks it's George <laughs> Clooney. <laughs> Amazing. No, I did not. Yes, you did. I tell did. me. Who would think tell that? Me, tell me, Dre, who is the worst Batman ever? <laughs> George <laughs> what? <laughs> who was that actor that was in ER for years? Mm-hmm. The worst Batman... Anthony Edwards. <laughs> yes. <laughs> worst worst Batman, Batman is George Westbury. Clooney. You, you think so? He, even he admits it. I, he, I would say he's a very good-looking Batman... And a very good-looking Bruce. You know so George funny? Clooney has a lot of potential to He's be a like good Batman. He's like the George Lazenbeek of Batman. Lord George Lazenbean. Did you just say George Lazenbeek? <laughs> George Lazenbean. George Lazenbean. George Lazenbeeks. No, I, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't compare. No, I w- no, because George. He's Lazen- more forgotten than George Lazen. George Clooney is more forgotten. He's way more forgotten as a Batman. Than, than yeah, but not as an act. But not as an. But the difference is George Clooney is a huge body of work outside of. I'm talking about as Batman. I he, forgot he him was a Batman. failing as Batman. Yeah, yeah but forgot. what's George Lazenby's body of work outside of his one Bond <laughs> film, the movie Stoner uh, with Angela Mao? He actually played James Bond in one of those straight to TV Man from Uncle films. Ah. Uh. In like the late seventies, and his whole thing—I don't think he even had any lines. He just drove along, no, saved right. Napoleon Solo from like being shot. And then they waved each other in the car, and that was it. And he actually got billing in the titles going into the film. Like, wow. Oh, George Lazenby's James Bond. It's like, yeah, okay, whatever. Wow. All right. But, so, uh, I get it. His body of work is not that much of a no, body you, you, like, you, like you, my body. Yeah, you cannot compare George Clooney's <laughs> body of work and the work of George Lazenby. All right. Beak. Lazenbeak. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, let's go. Give, give the question. Let's go here. Hi, Michael Cooney. All right. Alex. <laughs> <laughs> don't you think at some point Linda pulled Shannon aside and told her the truth and everything and explained what they were doing in protecting was what the character Bruce Lee that permeated the culture and that they understood its value I feel like at some point someone made that decision correctly or incorrectly, because it was all of it was all of valued. He really had left for them to stand on. Definitely not saying I agree with it, but also not in their shoes. Yeah, no, I get it. Uh, I mean, uh, this it makes no sense for me to speculate what Linda told Shannon. I mean, how how would I even know that? Um, she that pulled her to a small room. No, that doesn't. No, what, what, what do I know? What conversations Your went dad on did between coke. there? No, I mean it, it doesn't. I. I uh, you don't think that was? No, what does it matter? What the hell I would <laughs> speculate about conversations that were had most likely before I was even born. Mm-hmm. Doesn't make any sense. It would be a complete waste of time for me to even talk about that. I mean, what what do I know? What went on be- between Shannon and and Linda in terms of what Linda decided to divulge about you know revelations that have come out recently because of those letters. Mm-hmm. Um, I, no, I don't blame them for wanting to like protect the legacy and all that kind of. I mean, look, if you're the son of Elvis, all right, yeah, you, you want to monetize the shit out of it, right? My issue with the Lee estate is sometimes how they monetize Bruce Lee that uh, that I find is sometimes I have no problem of them monetizing Bruce Lee but I do have a couple issues with them for example like um selling his image to Johnny Walker and making him speak Mandarin all right okay. which I just find that's like a huge slap in the face to to Bruce Lee as a person like if I think if he would have known that he would be very offended because Bruce didn't even speak Mandarin it is I thought that that I thought it was very offensive, all right? Mm. Like like that that whole Johnny Walker thing, right? Um, and also just in general, like the kind of products that they sell, like the bee water flip-flops, that kind of stuff. I think that whoever's in charge of marketing at the Lee Estate could do much better. I, I cannot even imagine like if you put me, Hector Martinez, and Charles Damiano oh. in charge of product development for the Bruce wow. Lee Estate. Holy, the stuff that we would get. There's so much stuff... Because, look, y- y- there's stuff for casuals. Can I be down with that? Totally. There's stuff for casuals. You know, casuals are going to want, like, the normal Bruce Lee shirts yeah. and, you know, uh, be water, water <laughs> bottles, all that. Kind. Like, y- y- you have, like, you have your products for casuals. Hell yeah. But you also have to have products for, like, the hardcore fans. They're sitting on all sorts of stuff, uh, Bruce Lee related, that that really the fans would love to see and would appreciate. 
and they don't. And, and, and you know, they spend time suing people and they spend time giving Bruce Lee's brother and sister a hard time or whatever. Like, I, I, I just... Those are my issues. But mm. for me to speculate about whether Linda told Shannon all these kind of things or whatever and like, oh, and we need to protect his name. Like, no, I mean, the, the fact that they want to monetize and protect his legacy is the most normal thing in the world. When I when I, when I I call out Shannon or whatever, I would say, oh, she's making money off her debt. Dude, make money off your debt. He's your dad. All right? Just do it in a better way. Mm. Just, just, you know, maybe be nicer to your... Your aunts and uncles. Um, maybe, you know, listen to the fans a little bit more. Maybe not always do cheap, shitty documentaries like I Am Bruce Lee and that ESPN crap, all right? Because quite frankly, I don't care. You, do, you ever, do you ever see I Am Bruce Lee where they're mm -hmm. interviewing all these like weird celebrities of like, you know, some dude from Black Eyed Peas is like, yo, the way I hold the mic is influenced by Bruce Lee. And I'm thinking, yo, I don't give a shit. Why, why am I watching this? All right? <laughs> okay. Oh, I really give a crap about how a rapper holds a microphone was being influenced by Bruce Lee. I'm turning this shit off. All right, and right. I, Casey Evan realized, kind of a Bruce Lee fan. Mm -hmm. And I can't watch that shit. Oh, man. It's, just, it's, it's crap. I think he do. says everything you need to know that you didn't even mention that it was either Will I Am or Fergie. Because there's two other members of the Black Eyed Peas that no one knows. <laughs> right. I bet it was one of them. No. I think it was one of them. Yeah, I it think so. Yeah, no, it, was one of, it wasn't one of the ones that I know. It was the exactly. Kung Fu-y one. Whatever. Yeah. All right. They're awful. So what else you got? <laughs> so, no, nah, it just makes me wonder if I should, like, make money off my dad's, like, legacy, too. Hey, man, if your dad's a famous dude. Yeah. All right? Your dad is a Vin Diesel. You should totally make money off him. <laughs> all right? <laughs> it's far from it's not always about yeah. monetizing. Look, my dad was a paraplegic, right? Uh -huh. and, um So he couldn't do a lot of stuff when we were growing up. And what he said to me, he said, I can't do what normal dads do. So if you can get ahead at all by, like exploiting the fact that I'm a cripple, go right ahead. He said that? Yeah, he absolutely did. Jeez. Well, that's interesting. Said. There you go. So, yeah. You know, like he said, I mean, you know, obviously, I mean, he, we had a lot of fun, but like I would never do anything terrible. But yeah. Right. You know, once or twice, we're just like, mm -hmm. well, you know, my dad's got MS. So like, you know, we used to get all the sweet seats and mm. all the gigs for it. Right, you know right, what right, I mean? Right. Like stuff yeah. like that, 100%. You got to do it. Yeah. But I think, if you yeah if you can monetize you know you you your pops like i totally get i have no issue with that i just like, i just i inherited some ill artwork right yeah and i'm just like ah yeah should i sell it ah. i I, th I think i think the part that makes like a lot of the hardcore bruce lee fans kind of sad is that um the current iteration of the lee estate would be so different if brandon lee were still alive mm. it would be very different and if brandon lee were in charge of his dad's legacy you know, I, I think he would still want to be hands off, but I think he would put the right people in charge. And um, it would be it would be better than the way it is now. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, and it's just funny because you see like in the uh, Bruce Lee social media stuff, like the, the official Bruce Lee accounts mm -hmm. that like whether it's Shannon doing it herself, which could be sometimes or or it's like an assistant doing it. They don't know shit about Bruce Lee. Um, like, like he, he, as a, like a hardcore Bruce Lee fan, the yeah. least amount of Bruce Lee knowledge you'll ever get is from the official Bruce Lee stuff because it's all very superficial. It's all very bubblegum, right? Mm -hmm. The other, um, the other day, the Bruce Lee estate posted on Instagram a photo of a behind the scenes from Enter the Dragon, and oh, it's like, yeah. and it's like Bruce Lee looking on, and it's Bolo picking up uh, Lam Ching Ying, and it's like a, it's like a, it looks like they're doing a test. Like uh, Bolo picking someone up and throwing him, right? And the person that he's picking up is Lam Cheng Ying, mm -hmm. all right, who we know from the movie Prodigal Son yeah. and, and was a a huge um, supporter of Bruce Lee. And um, also, uh, what what people don't realize is during Bruce Lee's funeral, um, Golden Harvest had a, a team of security, and they were all the stuntmen. And Lam Cheng Ying, along with Sammo Hung, they were actually the security at Bruce Lee's funeral. Shit. And then the photo was like Bolo picking up Lam Cheng Ying and Bruce is kind of watching on and said like caption this. And then like I'm just thinking like there's part of me that goes whoever posted this doesn't realize that the person that Bolo is picking up is someone who would have given his arm for Bruce Lee. Oh, yeah. All right. You know, because Lam Ching Ying was a struggling stuntman at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he was on Big Boss. And he immediately realized how amazing Bruce Lee was. And then he became essentially part of Bruce Lee's movie Entourage. And when Bruce Lee was being challenged by Lao Dai Chun in the press, all right, this kind of two-bit nobody. Yeah. 
and they were at a restaurant, and Lam Qingying was there. Lam Qingying was so offended that this guy was challenging Bruce Lee that he went up to Lao Tai Chun in a restaurant. And Lam Qingying, by, by all accounts, was a pretty peace-loving dude. He wasn't like a thug or a gangster. But he was so offended that He's Lao like Tai Chun is trying to to call out Bruce Lee in the newspapers when he's really just a kelefe, he's just a nobody, all right? <laughs> uh, and then and then he walks up to Lao Tai Chun in the restaurant and tells him like, you are not, in Cantonese, you are not effing qualified to challenge my sifu. He respected Bruce Lee so much, he called Bruce Lee his sifu, even though he wasn't learning martial arts from him. Right. But that's what he called him. And he says, if you want to fight, you have to fight with me first. And Lam Ching Yin was like a, a <laughs> peace-loving dude, right? right. And that's the random guy that's being picked up by Bolo. Uh -huh. And it's like, and you just see like, you know, if someone actually knew something about Bruce Lee's story, they would say something about like the, you know, the guy who's being picked up, you yeah. know, Lam Ching Ying was someone who was like, you know, there in Bruce Lee's corner because at Bruce Lee's funeral, all right, Lam Ching Ying was like devastated, mm. but he was there working security because that's what he was supposed to do for his Sifu's funeral. That's kind of right? like what I would do if I saw a Dr. Eisen somewhere in like a restaurant. I'll roll up on you him. Would, you would call him out, right? I'll roll up on yeah, his you ass roll up quick. On. What about Dryson? Yeah. You're not qualified. You're not to qualified to, to challenge like, my Sifu, yeah, right? What the hell is wrong with him? So anyway, so I uh, the, the, the the Bruce Lee estate wrote, like, caption this. Yeah. And then there was a big part of me that was like, um, you know, wanted to say something to Shannon about, like, you know, do, 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 do you remember that that dude who's getting picked up was at you your father's wanted, funeral, oh, right? Oh, man. But then I was like, no. So I just wrote some very KFG shit. <laughs> I go... <laughs> That guy, who's being picked up by Bolo, did the stunts for Han. Mm -hmm. He he catches Bob Wall when Bob Wall gets sidekicked by Bruce Lee. Okay. He gets kicked through a glass window by Jim Kelly when he's fighting Han. You know, when Jim Kelly is sidekicked, the one stunt guy goes through the glass window? That yeah. was Lam Ching Ying. Oh, so man. Lam Ching Ying did nothing but eat shit in that movie, all right? He gets he has to catch Bob Wall when he gets kicked. He gets he gets kicked through a window yeah. by Jim Kelly. Woo. He does all the stunts for Wasn't Han. Wasn't even a sugar window. Yeah, he yeah. does all the stunts for Han because Sekin was too old. So like when Bruce oh, did those sweeps man. and he slammed, that was all yeah. that was all uh, uh, Lam Ching Ying doing that, right? And then I'm like, he did, he did this for Han. He got kicked through here. He did this. He did this, and he didn't get his name in the credits. Oh. And that was that was my caption. <laughs> <laughs> Eddie gets chucked by Bolo behind the scenes and not even in the movie. <laughs> like, so, you know. Anyway. Ouch. So, uh, yeah. Damn, damn. What damn. else you got? All right. Next up, we got Osan Andach, my Seabock. Osan. Oh, there you go. Yeah, it's been a Yo, minute. Dre, did you mean Eric? What are you talking about? I think he's talking about when, uh, when we were talking about, like, schools, your branches. And I was oh, talking, okay. I mentioned like there was you a guy let who that, went You to, actually let that question get through? I, I as much know. as I love Ozan. I have the filter there. By the time this comes out, yeah. that's like six episodes ago. How's the audience <laughs> no. going to know what you're even talking about? Hey. All right. I yes, don't even know I what you're Eric. talking did you, about. Did you mean Eric? Yes. Okay. Yes. This is, com yo, this is compelling conversation on the Kung Fu Genius podcast. It is. All right. No, but did I, you mean I wanted Eric? to yeah, address Eric. it. All right. I wanted to address it. Good. Eric. Good. Now, not, not, now that's it. So it was Eric. Okay, it was so, Eric. All right. Good, good, good. See, all right. All right. Good. All right. Next Thanks up, we got. clearing that up. Yes. Thank you for asking. All right. Two minutes, the listeners will never get back in their life. <laughs> or us. <laughs> or us. All right. Let's go. John Lee. John Lee. I know a John Lee. He, sure it do. might be the same one. Yeah. Will this upcoming fight between the KFG and Beardy be a pay-per-view event? Maybe have Master Wong as referee? <laughs> that would be great. Yes. Um, yeah, can you imagine a pay-per-view event, Beer KFG versus Beardy? Yeah. You know, I just can't imagine what this dude <laughs> looks, looks like. like. Yeah. <laughs> Because he's, he's you know, I mean, he's lied about being an MMA fighter. Right. He's lied about being called Bernard McAllister. We can have an undercard. Uh, Dreisen versus Dre Eisen. Ooh. Ooh. Dreisen Good versus undercard. Dre Eisen yeah. versus Dr. Eisen. Mop the floor up with this fucking <laughs> I mean, effing guy. Yeah, Dr. Eisen's the uh, in-house doctor oh, wait. for the event. Wait. Oh, yeah. He could be, oh. be the cut man. No, yeah. I'll I'll definitely body Dr. Eisen. I'll body Dr. Eisen. <laughs> Let me, no, let me have Dr. Eisen. Keep Dreisen for Mikey. Okay. No, but Kay, yeah. it's a seagull, right? So. I already handled Dreisen anyway. Oh, his, yeah. His, 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 his face can tell you. But I'll, no, give me Dr. Eisen. All right. So who's in your corner? 
Who's in my corner to fight Beardy? Yeah. I don't know. I could have an imaginary fairy. You need a in cut. You don't even need a cut man. Oh come on! With well, these guys, <laughs> these guys just a, this, this guy's a small nerd <laughs> making up Bruce Lee stuff in, 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 in Europe somewhere, Hi. laughing yeah. at his own jokes. Oh, that was funny. Yeah. <laughs> Scanning the internet for uh, for photos of Jack oh, dudes I or like these nipples yeah, let yeah. me add these in wow. you know you know what's funny the uh, in, in that video where he claimed to train like Bruce Lee for a year yeah. and we talked about that and then he posted photos of himself of course without his head and there were two different photos where yeah. he posted about it uh, you know pos- supposedly of himself and we quickly realized like even the nipples are not the same on these right. two dudes we did a reverse Google image search and found out these are two different <laughs> fitness trainers it's not even the same person so uh, Beardy didn't even have the I don't know no, the the, the 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 smarts yeah, to, to try to, say, to get wait. fake photos from the same person, right? Yeah, no. And then, like, <laughs> recently someone emailed us. They also did the same Google search, and they were like, oh, yeah, these two photos. Are, it's like, yeah, we already yeah, did yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We... It's already well established <laughs> that Beardy's photos of himself are, in fact, not uh, of himself. You know and what made two me laugh? different people. What? You know what made me laugh recently? I was watching, um, was it Fist of Fury? Uh-huh. With the, with the dude who had the... The Japanese the thing, and he had the, that nipple shot where yeah. it zooms in on the nipples. Yeah. And did you watch I, it in English or in Chinese? Oh, of course, it was in dubbed. What? I don't uh, have the I don't have I don't have the how KFG. Can you, how can you be the co-host not, of the Kung Fu Genius podcast I'm and watch it dubbed in English? Not on that level yet. I'm trying. So, so basically, to get he walks in and he goes, "So you're Japanese." <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. We but gotta, the zoom in it made me laugh because it made yeah. me think about Beardy. Yeah, and he, he should have used those. Right. Yeah. yeah exactly. It exactly. would have been. It would have worked out much yeah. better for. We got to get Hector Martinez on here because he can. Ah. He knows. Uh, you know what's weird? Like when I meet Hector, because Hector is such a huge, obviously Bruce Lee fan right. and collector, but he'll. Um, he can do like all the dubbed voices. First of all, he can do Bruce Lee pitch perfect. And also Hector Martinez is the guy exactly. who does the beginning of the Kung Fu Genius. He's unstoppable, unbeatable, mm-hmm. right? And he is imitating the voice of the guy who did the original English trailer for Fist of Fury. So if you watch, uh, if you go on YouTube and look for the original trailer, English Fist yes. of Fury, and you listen to that guy, who was I think a Puerto Rican or Dominican guy. His name right. was Adolf. I forgot his uh-huh. I forgot his last name, but his first name was Adolf. You can't forget that. And Adolf uh, uh, Martinez. Something like that, right? Yeah. No, it's not no, it's not Martinez, <laughs> but it's something, it's a similar name, right? Anyway, Hector can when you listen to the original trailer for uh-huh. Fist of Fury in English and you listen to what Hector does at the beginning of the KFG podcast. It's exactly the same. As a matter of fact, I've had people comment and go, how did you get the guy oh. who did the original trailer for Fist of Fury to Dope. do the KFG thing? No, no, that's Hector, right? But Hector, like, I'll meet I'll, I'll meet him, like, we'll go to Angela Mao's restaurant or something yeah. like that, and he'll spout a bunch of lines from Bruce Lee movies from the dubbed version. And me, being a Bruce Lee geek, I still don't know what he... I still know because I don't watch the dubbed English. I haven't watched the dubbed English version of those movies since the 1980s. Since, since, yeah. All okay. right? Like, so when when, you know... He, he'll Since do the Saturday whole thing like you afternoon know. theater yeah I don't know if they show the Bruce Lee movies on that but he'll be like really? you know I tell you we are not <laughs> sick men you know and it's like I know the Chinese you know version they gauge you Chung my bank fu right uh, and so like I like they he'll say the English version and then I'll be like oh oh right right I have to like translate it in my head right so anyway um, man well, yeah let's get him up on let's do it yeah yeah trade for a day bring some stuff Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Bring some goodies. And stop watching dubbed versions of good films, Dre. That's right. Yeah, watch them in the original language. We should do a dubbed version. We should do a version. (laughs) Of something. Of something. I can uh, talk in the English guy. Can can I tell you can I tell you some secret about the KFG's past? What? But I think the statute of limitations on this potential crime has ran out. (laughs) 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 Yes. All right. You've dubbed some movies so uh, in in the in the, I didn't, in I the don't 90s love no in the 90s that was a thing back all then. right in the 90s um me and my boys we yeah. would go we would rent videos like you know you had video stores back in the day right and uh we we, we, we went to uh we lived in washington state uh-huh. so near seattle and so we had cars so we could like we could find like weird video rental places in the middle of nowhere right so we would go and we would get like accounts at these video rental places right and we would just look to find like the shittiest like b movies you know the stuff that would just be on youtube for free like total gar- like either garbage like yeah. horror movies or like the worst burt reynolds movie that no one ever uh, watches yes. right and um 
we would rent these like total turd burglar movies and I had a VCR at home <laughs> uh -huh. that actually had the, the VCR itself had the ability to overdub the audio on the VCR. Wow. So um, me and like my boys. You had your my, microphones. My, my, no, my boy Brady had a four track. Oh, all right? yes. And then we plugged the four track into mm, the VCR. Direct. And then we had four mics. Mm. And then what we would do is we would each have a mic <laughs> and then ah, we would not watch the movie. All right. Um, we would we wouldn't watch it first. So we knew what was going on. We mm -hmm. would just watch it and overdub the audio as we were watching it. Yes. All right. And yes. it was like crazy. Like so we would have like three people would be um, the would play different characters here and, and the there. fourth person would just be sound effects because you have to also have to have sound <laughs> right so when a car was driving you'd be like <laughs> or, 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 or like yeah. you would, would give like the dude would have a motorcycle uh -huh. and instead of making a front we'd go <laughs> we'd even make sounds that like weren't congruent to what was going on Please. the guy would shoot a gun and it would go bang yeah. bang <laughs> <laughs> and we would overdub these entire movies right these and then we would return them we yeah. would, no we would return them <laughs> we, to the we VCR them. <laughs> On, on the due date. <laughs> yes. And uh, no late fees. Well, the crazy thing was these movies were so terrible. No one else rented them again. And we never got a call back like, yo, did you mess up this video? Because we would find the movies that no one else would rent. Oh, and yes. one of those movies, all right, is an 80s action movie called Never Too Young to Die, starring John Stamos and Gene Simmons from Kiss. Wow. As the villain. And it also had vanity in it. <gasps> yes. And we Ooh. dubbed that. Dude, it was, the movie was crazy. All right. So did you play Vanity? <laughs> I don't remember. I don't remember. We had But you know, to. these were so funny. Like our overdubs were so funny yeah. that we ended up, we would play them on public access in Seattle. Public access only gave you a half hour time slot. Mm -hmm. So my boy would chop this hour and a half dub of uh, Never Too Young to nice. Die into three half hour segments. Wow. And we would play them on like Friday nights on public access and people would like go crazy. They thought it was the funniest shit. And nobody would ever go like, um, excuse me, uh, Mr. Richter, we have a we have a problem with our copy of Never Too Young to Die. Do you know anything about this? Because they just showed you that no one else no, ever no, rented that. Rented the, uh, and now that there are no more video rental stores, oh, man. Uh, we don't have to worry about it. I'm sure there's a secondhand store somewhere in Renton yeah. that has an overdubbed version of Never Too Young to Die. I would, love, I would, I would give my left nut. It was ridiculous. Left testicle yes. to see this. Yes. So man. anyway. All right. All right. What else you got? Uh, we got a reply from Mac Attack. Nah, let Master Wong do commentary. Instead of referee. Oh, sounds good. If he refs the fight, we will never get started. He'll just talk and talk. <laughs> Perfect. Yes. All right. Next up, we got Benny Aruba. All right. I'd love to see if you'd switch it up for one hip-hop genius, man. Oh, because we talked about Wu-Tang on one of the episodes. Mm, yeah. The hip-hop genius episode. Yeah. You know what's weird? Uh, I've been watching that second season of like Wu-Tang, yeah. the saga, right? Yeah. And uh, Which is great because it's like the whole it's backstory it. and everything like that. And my daughters are like, they keep watching it. And first of all, it's super inappropriate for kids because every other word is like F this, F that. It's like drug related. So yeah. I'm like, girls, this show is not for you. And they're like, no, they're super into it. They're like, oh, is this how they write like the songs? And like, you know, oh, it's like is that how they figure out the beats and stuff like that. They're like super into it. And they're like asking me like about Wu-Tang. It's crazy. What? Yeah. You know, I was just catching up on old KFG episodes this last couple of days. Yeah. Like the Sorry ones that I wasn't here for. I yeah. think that Those was the, the one you were ones. talking about, Hip Hop Genius. I was like, how did you manage to talk about one of the greatest songs ever and one of the greatest videos? Triumph. Ever? No, oh. no, Rico Suave. Oh, I wasn't even here mention. for that. I love that we song. I'm sure you do. That song is amazing. Oh, I can imagine I that you have a Gerardo poster above your bed. <laughs> no, but I do have three Still, copies of it on vinyl, so including the Spanglish and the full Spanish version. Wow, wow. You know, don't let my the, lyrics mislead you. I don't love you, but I need you. Would you Jesus rather have me lie, God. take a piece of your pie, listen to me and say, why, oh, why? Wow. Hip hop you know, genius is in the house. You know, there was a, that time period. There were a lot of like Spanglish rap songs. Do you remember Mellow Man Ace? 
Mentirosa. Today you tell me something y mañana otra cosa. Ain't got nobody, baby. It was that the Santana thing on there, right? Anyway, we're losing listeners by the minute. All right, okay, let's go. All right. <laughs> All right, next up we got we'll, we'll do Derek. we'll do hip hop genius after dark for Patreons. Yeah. Derek Finrare. All right. Sifu, the people spoke. We want that hip hop genius video as also fire. Okay, I'll tell you a uh, last thing on hip hop before all of our audience goes away, all right? <laughs> um so Kess the MC. Yeah. The who, one who did, the, who did intro. The, the Kung Fu Genius rap song, right? Yes. Uh, and who's also an amazing MC in his own right. If you guys don't follow Kessy MC on Instagram or um, mm-hmm. I think he's on SoundCloud. He be on a y- yeah, I want to get him. I want to get Kess on here because he's got old stories. He yeah. used to train with Sifu Grados back in the day. Yeah. He knows all sorts of great old stories. Kess is one of those guys. He's like <laughs> Kess is our Charlie Murphy. Right. All right. Exactly. He's got all these old stories yeah. in New York, and when when he starts telling these stories, and I you sit see back, the cartoon like, of it back in yeah. the '90s in the club, everything yeah. like that. We we need to have him tell stories, and then uh-huh. have someone animate it because he's got the craziest stories. Right. Please. Sometimes please. he drives me home after training, and then he'll just <laughs> tell me like the wildest stuff. <laughs> and right. You just leave the car. I just leave like... the car with my mind blown and my jaw <laughs> dragging on the floor. Right. Yeah. So um, anyway, the other day he told me uh-huh. that. He wants to re-record the Kung Fu Genius rap song, but he wants me to rap it. Because he says in the Kung Fu Genius rap song, he is rapping as if he is me. True. And he says, but it should actually be me rapping those lyrics because it's me. I mean, you know it by now. I do know it by now. So he's like, yo, we'll go to the studio. We'll get go me. We'll do the thing and you'll do the, the, the lyrics and whatever. So I don't know. Maybe in the future. But anyway, I think we have now alienated every single listener of this yeah, podcast. Yeah, less M&M and more vanilla rice. All right, there we go. <laughs> All right, let's go. Next one. All right, next up we got Andrew Lin. All right. Andrew Lin, what do you think about bulking and cutting? Hold on. Mm-hmm. Bulking scroll, and cutting. Bulking and cutting. Your scroll game week. Yeah. <laughs> Boking and cutting for building muscle mm-hmm. versus the idea of main gaining. Mm. Is right. it man gaining or no, main gaining? No, it's main gaining, which I means to maintain your current level uh, of, let's say, body fat or to reduce your percentage of body fat while building muscle. All that's right? lit. I so, like um, main Yeah, so, so th- th- there's like a theory that if you, know, you want to get jacked, mm-hmm. you basically have to bulk. Mm-hmm. Meaning that you have to eat a lot of extra calories so that you get a lot of mass and then you're going to start lifting weights and then that mass is going to convert into muscle. Uh, now, look, I'm not a sports physiologist. I'm you not an exercise physician, but that's what a lot of people say. All right. You, you bulk up and then you convert all that bulk into like raw beef horsepower. Right. So I'm a big fan of uh, Greg Doucette, Coach mm-hmm. Greg here on YouTube. He's got a huge channel. He doesn't need he doesn't need my endorsement. I need his. Um, he, uh, he's, you know, f- uh, like former professional bodybuilder. Mm-hmm. He's an expert. He has a, a degree in kinesiology. He's, he's the dude you want to listen to on this stuff. And he's, I think the one who coined the term main gaining. So he says bulking and cutting is bullshit. Okay. Because basically what happens is when you bulk and you eat a bunch of food, all right, you are getting fatter and you are just getting a bunch of more water in your system. And that is not going to then automatically convert into contractile muscle tissue just because now you're going to start lifting. So he basically says what ends up happening is you got, you know, you 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 work out, you get your, your muscles, then people bulk and all they do is get fat. And then they have to cut all of that extra fat and water that they added like to essentially work. get back to where they were before they bulked. Or maybe they have a little bit more muscle, but they have a little bit more muscle because they've been working out more, not because of the bulking. So basically, you're wasting your time getting fat, thinking you're going to turn that into muscle because that's not really how it works. It's much harder to to gain muscle tissue, the lean muscle mass. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, there, there's no hack to like just get fat and then change that You've into never muscle seen mass. Arnold bulk up, right? He, no, he was yeah, so so basically, he's of the opinion it. that it's it's bullshit, and uh-huh. I have um, I never tried to like bulk and then cut, but just from my own you know weight fluctuations or whatever, I I would tend to agree with Coach Greg outside of the fact that he's also an expert in this topic here, um, that 
just trying to stuff your face to gain weight and then like convert that and get shredded from there. No, because now you're going to have to lose all that weight. You know, all the muscle and fat that you have on you, you're going to have to get rid of that through cardio and diet to get back to the lean muscle tissue. So why are you adding fat and water to just have to take it away? And then if you gained a little bit of muscle mass in between, it's because of your working out, not because of the bulking. Mm. So you're just doing extra work, getting fat and then losing weight. You're like telling yourself, I'm going to get fat so I have to go on a diet so I can then show the muscles that I kind of have already. So uh, it doesn't, it, in my opinion, it doesn't make sense. But if oh, you guys want to know more about that, I mean, you know, don't, don't bitch at me in the comments. No, man, yo, there was this one study from 1966 that said bulking with an... Shut up. All right, just watch uh, Coach Greg, all right? Uh, Don't ask me medical questions and stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? Oh, man. Anyway, what else you got for me? All right, next up. My bad. I got to scroll again. This this laptop's a little old, but yeah. whatever. Yeah, I know what else is old. Yeah. Uh, we got Do <laughs> Dr. Eisen. See, as soon as you say, oh, hang on a minute, I've got to scroll a bit. Yeah. You know what that means. Yeah. Yeah, what? it's gonna be That's some a chump. euphemism for I'm gonna ask you some chumpy question by some chumpy person. Yeah, Doctor Eisen. The question may not even be there either, right? You might right. just be like pretending. Well, yeah. I'm right. going I, to read the question. All right, now. let's go. Yeah, you know how you know he's gonna read the question because he said it. He has to let you know that he's gonna read. No other question does he doesn't go like for the top question like Shadow Mancer. I'm gonna read this question right now, but for some reason for Doctor Eisen and Dreisen, he's like I'm gonna read this question now. Like such an overcompensation. Absolutely. All right. All right. Let's go. All right. Okay, let's read go. Read the question. Let's go. Moving right along. Yeah. Moving right along. Doctor Eisen was recently going through some records at my hospital and found out you were actually born in 1957? Damn, you you cool. were a direct student of Bruce in Hong Kong when he passed? You were 16 at the time? Right after his funeral, you, att you attended his funeral and you mysteriously disappeared with Wu Nan the butler and your fraud just admit it I, I think we should just stop I'm, I'm 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 i don't want to keep reading this well, no, do carry on it's interesting how you make yourself look younger by doing what you do and of course you're on the horsey sauce but we don't need to go there but we know seriously what's next he question the next drug question. letters are are all made up by you that's literally what he ends off with uh, uh, i don't feel comfortable talking about that yeah let's drug, go we don't need to talk let's, about let's drug go to letters anymore let's go to the next question i don't feel comfortable talking about that all right next up we got fernando nunez nunez your business <laughs> All right, let's go. <laughs> Noon, yes, your business. <laughs> what? That's like none. Yeah. All right. Hi, KFG, TFG, TBG. Oh, oh yeah. finally got a shout out. All right. All right. Great podcast, as always. All right. Great. All right. I oh. have a question. In one of his students' videos, Sifu David Peterson talked about the BUG form. And he said that WSL referred to the form as pointing at the moon finger. Mm -hmm. Also, he said in he said it in Cantonese, but I don't know how to write it. I would like to hear your take on it. Thanks. Uh, no, this is an interesting take. Um, that's probably a question way better for Sifu David Peterson, maybe on a future podcast to talk about that. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a very specific interpretation of what the BUG means. Mm. Um, it's different from the way I learned it. So it doesn't, uh, I think my opinion on that is pretty worthless. So uh, I would like to hear David Peterson explain that. Yeah, right, that's so not, that's not a question for the KFG. Yeah, we just got to uh, get him here. Oh, we'll get him here. Yeah. All right. He just All lives right. in Malaysia. We'll get him. We'll get him over here by next week. All right. The world's opening up. <laughs> Can you imagine if we had Steve David Peterson here in the studio in New York? That would be, be so lit. dope. That, that would be, be so awesome. Yeah. Be lit. All right. Next up, we got. Steven Richardson. All right. Q. My scroll. What's your take on the scholarship findings and conclusions of the creation of Wing Chun and the Tao of Wing Chun? Thanks. 
Um, I've actually talked about this before. So the Tao of Wing Chun is a book about the history of Wing Chun. I think it's it's written by our friend John Little and Danny Xuan. I have not read that book. All right. So I, I yeah, unfortunately, as much as I love John Little, I've not I've not read that book yet. Um, I will get to it at some point. I have uh, I have my current. If anyone's ever been to my place. I have a bookshelf in my living room, which is like all the current shit that I'm reading. Mm -hmm. And then I have all the stuff that I've already read in my office. Mm. And then I have a pile of books that is waiting to go onto the shelf of stuff that I'm that I'm currently reading. So okay. I'm super backlogged on books right now. So I can't say anything about um, uh, about the, the John Little book. The creation of Wing Chun book uh, by Ben Judkins, I have talked about that multiple times. Um, Ben Judkins is a scholar and uh, takes a very scholarly and academic approach to the history of Wing Chun. Um, I've read it. Um, mm -hmm. It's a little bit like watching a rose grow in slow motion. <laughs> um, and I'm, oh, I'm no. kind of a geek about this stuff. Like he goes into a lot of the background of the society at the time that Wing Chun was developed. Mm -hmm. And it some of it reads a little bit like filler, like let me go way into the socioeconomic uh, situation of Qing Dynasty China so you can understand the the culture from whence Wing Chun came. And it just some of that stuff just feels a little bit like filler. It seems like he's just writing a lot of stuff to get around the fact that there's a lot of meat and potato stuff that he simply doesn't know. Because when it really comes to the history of Wing Chun, we really just don't know. Um, and then what I took issue with is when it comes to the more modern and more recent events within the Wing Chun style, when he talks about some things that happen during Yip Man's time, mm -hmm. there are a number of factual errors in there. And he, um, w when you're looking at something academically, it's very important to avoid bias, all right, which is why I will never consider myself an academic scholar because I definitely have bias. But there are certain, in his, in in the part where he talks about Yip Man Wing Chun and the more recent issue, there's certain things that he takes from certain Sifus at face value and then discounts from others because they seem to not fit a certain narrative that he likes. And that comes off very non-academic. Okay. Um, and then so um, I, it, it's also a little weird. I don't know too much about his background. I believe he was actually a professor at Columbia University, so he's very educated and very learned. I know but, that university. Yeah, but um, as I mentioned before, um, there seems to be a little bit of a disconnect between the author and the culture that he's writing about because it's written about in, in a very, very dry and academic way, which misses, I think, the feeling of what these things should mean for the reader because it's just trying to tell it in dry facts which I get, you're trying not to add any spin or bias, but there's a cultural element that's missing. And I said it before, and I'll say it again, the book feels like the equivalent of a manual about having sex written by someone who has not had sex, okay? Um, so it's one thing to have, to write all the technical stuff from a technical standpoint and be accurate. And it's another thing if the author actually knows the subject matter <laughs> It just there's just a Damn. certain little bite in there that just it's just kind of missing. Damn. I have slogged through the book once. And normally I, I read like, for example, like Sifu David Peterson's books. I've read and reread them multiple times, right? But the creation of Wing Chun, I I forced myself to finish it. And mm. I'm a geek about this stuff. Like I I just, you know, I had to do like the clockwork orange thing, like force my eyes open, yeah. right? And then strap myself into a chair and literally force myself to finish that book. Oh, it was it was a hard read. Um and I'm kind of a geek about this stuff. So anyway. Damn. Damn, that's damn, what I think damn. about that. Do we have time for one more? One more. All right. Next up we got CT Leffler. CT Leffler in the house. All right, first off. Shout out to the KFG for the awesome insight into martial arts. All right. To Dre for being the best sidekick on a Kung Fu podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that was a backhanded compliment, by the way. All oh, right. yeah. Do you know how many Kung Fu podcasts there are that have sidekicks? Uh, only one. <laughs> yes. Right. And imagine if you were only the second best sidekick. <laughs> 
<laughs> Ooh, I think that was kind of a bird. <laughs> not, not really. Not, I, yeah. I take it as a compliment. You're the best. I take it as a... Not a backhand compliment. Right. Yes. Fronthand compliment. Right. <laughs> you are you are the best sidekick of a kung fu podcast that comes out of Midtown Manhattan. All right, go to it. <laughs> I am the best disembodied British voice coming out of a kung fu side podcast. <laughs> right. All right. What else? What else we got? And to the producer Mike for the great production values and audio quality. Well, thank you very much. All right. My question. What are the top three things that you remind your students to do as they progress through the WT program? Uh, I don't have a top three list because it's different for everyone. All right. Um, because every, everyone's struggle is different. Like, you know, when, with, with Wing Chun, Wing Chun is a, can be an aggressive martial art. So some people, when they start learning Wing Chun, they struggle with the idea like, okay, you need to close the gap and and and, mm -hmm. and neutralize what your opponent is trying to do to you. So basically you're saying like, all right, some dude is going to try to do something to you. You need to get close and swarm them. That is not a simple behavior for everyone to learn because they have to overcome maybe certain fears that they have, right? So the person who has that fear of going in and being direct and confronting the fight head on, they're going to have to have an entire different set of correctives than the student who already comes super aggressive and ready to go. Um, that student is probably going to have hurdles with calming down, <laughs> taking it easy, relaxing, and also maybe not just running straight into punches, right? Mm. So so the problem is that you have the, the student that is like a little bit timid, and then you have the student that's maybe a little overly aggressive, and then you have to give those two different types of students different notes, right? And then you have students who come from a previous martial arts background. Who has to empty the cup. Yeah, man. so they have to relearn some stuff. Um, although, uh, honestly, the hardest the hardest people to teach in a Wing Chun school are people who come from other Wing Chun schools. Because Wing Chun people are so set in like, no, we do Lap Da this way, you do Poon Sao this way, you do it this way here, that um, they think you're just showing them a slightly different version of the same thing they learned instead mm. of going like, no, what we're actually doing is different from what you did before. You need to kind of reset if you want to understand what I'm showing you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the willingness for that is not there because they're like, yeah, I kind of already know this. And it's like... Um, no, yeah. you really do need to empty your cup, even more so if you come from another Wing Chun school. A, someone who has years of karate, all right? Yeah, they might have a problem being stiff or they might have a problem getting close, but the movements are still going to be new, so they can still kind of learn them with kind of a fresh mind. But people who've done years of another Wing Chun, Lap Da a certain way, Poon Sao a certain way, that can be a lot more challenging than teaching someone who has years of some other martial art, right? Oh, right. So it's it's impossible for me to say these are like the three things that I remind my students of the most because everyone's journey is individual. The one student has issues like mentally, right? Mm -hmm. They don't see themselves being good at something or um, they have weird mental blocks about maybe like I have some students, they have lots of baggage from previous instructors, all right? Mm. I have students from other Wing Chun lines that were treated like garbage from their previous Wing Chun Sifu, all right? And so they had they come with like a lot of this kind of baggage that you then have to help them unload. That person's journey is different than the person who got mugged and is coming to me for self-defense. Mm -hmm. And they have a completely different focus. Different from the person who just saw the IP Man movie and wants to learn how to fight like Yip Man, oh, right? right? And different from the 50-year-old exec who wasn't allowed to do martial arts when he was younger, but uh -huh. now he's old enough and has time and money and wants to do it, right? So you can't say here are the three things. The three things for whom, right? It's mm -hmm. different for everyone. And that's all I got to say about that. All right, everyone. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Kung Fu Genius. As always, don't forget to subscribe to the Kung Fu Genius. Hit that bell for notifications. And for anything you want to ask me on a future episode, go ahead and write it in the comments below. And don't forget, if you are interested in coming to Hong Kong with the KFG sometime next year, let me know in the comments below. And as always, I'll see you guys next time. Word is I'm a kung fu genius Technique speaks for me, not lineage Forget Jet Li, cause I'm the one Many call me Sifu, but to you I'm Seagung And I produce masters, you surpassed us Your kung fu stiffer than corpse and caskets City Wing Chun is the house I built Violate the gate and your blood gets spilt Alex Richter, always the victor uh, I, So I don't know the reason uh, Oops, hey uh, oh, So, <laughs> crazy, there's a ghost in here uh, <laughs> Jesus That was like one take
it's usually one take, except that one time when I just couldn't get it together. <laughs> we you need that back. Spiked yes. my coffee. We need that KFG back. Hilarious. All right. All right so um, write in the comments if okay. you want that no, KFG back. No, none of this is getting in there. Love that. Wow. wow. What, what was? I was convinced you were gonna f that up because I could see. I, I always no, do one take. I could see Me you too. smiling. I could see him smiling a little bit, <laughs> and his energy was like a little hot and cold in some uh, spots. And I'm like, he's gonna lose it. He's gonna and then when it comes to the last one, he's gonna forget it. And you did it. Well, he did the whole musical theater thing right at the beginning when he goes all sorts. Yeah, that was. I, yeah. I, I thought I was gonna botch it with. Yeah, the ones I that, did that's that. him like yeah. elongating it to remember uh, what is the thing that comes <laughs> next. Right there, nah, you go. That wasn't why I did yeah, that. Yeah, no, that's the only why you did. Oh, 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 oh,